course, he sat down, doused himself with lighter fluid, set himself on fire, and literally sparked Arab Spring. That government fell in a few weeks, and then it started to just, you know, fire across the Arab world. Why? Because they knew that they were being controlled and ruled by every... And what are they going to do? Ask for, you know, Pharaoh number 337? We need to be ruled right? So what did I do? I understood what was happening. I looked at this um, CIA fact book they keep on countries. You look at Egypt, there's about... You know, 80 million people in the country, about 17, 20 million in the Nile uh, River Delta there in Cairo. If you look at the numbers, 33% of the population in Egypt is 14 years of age and younger. You go up to 24 years of age, it's over 50%. They were, 40% of the people were living on less than $4 a day. Food prices went up 120% in one year. They were hungry. And there was nothing you were going to do to stop it. So what did we do? We said, I already know where this goes. I'm interviewing people from Bahrain as the Saudi Arabian tanks were coming in. In Tahrir Square, you could hear, you know, the noise in the background. From Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Tunisia, Libya. I mean, bring it on, man. I want to talk to all these people. And we'd make some effort and big phone bills. So what happens is, as I'm talking to you, if I put on there a sign that in Arabic said, we know the truth, would they know what that is? Yep. So we took the Banksy Revolution logo, you know, and throwing a bouquet of flowers. Many of you may have seen that. That's how the revolution was known in Europe. So we go, all right, we translated, we know the truth in Arabic on the bottom. Cato had, um, we got hundreds of these uh, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Bill of Rights translated English and Arabic. And they read this way, so it went in reverse order. On the Constitution page, we put a little mailing label in Arabic that said, uh, we already tried this, maybe you can do better. <laughs> but I wanted them to get the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. Why? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's the baloney sandwich in the middle of this Constitution thing, you know, and you've got the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. You read the Constitution, it's all the power to the power to the power to the power. You know, they're going, well, you know, uh, you know, what happens? You know, we've got the separation of powers. We've got executive, legislative, judicial. What happens when they're all aligned against the rights of the individual? I'll tell you what happens. You find yourself in a free speech zone. That's what happens. So what do you, what do you advocate? What was the declaration? That's why my show, declare your independence with Ernest Hancock. Why? Because it said not what kind of government they were going to have. It's how to recognize when it was bad. Governments constituted among men to what? Secure these rights, these individual life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And I'd argue your property is part of that. So I'm going, okay, all right. So when are governments bad? When they don't do that. When they are the very person, entity, shiny badge, uniform, gun, fine hat, they're taking your rights away. Is this complicated? No, it's very simple. How do you advocate that? in an election campaign. How do you advocate that as a change in culture? How do you advocate for that? You live it. You treat people, you don't, you don't look to make them do your great idea. You encourage them that the best idea is their idea. You know how many times you get as party people, they'll come in and they go, you know what you should do? How many people have heard that? You know what you should do? Anybody in leadership, you get a big giant stack of you shoulds. I got, a, I got a stack this high of uh, I created my shoulds. You're going to compete with my you should? You know? So the thing is, what we did is we created infrastructure. Freedoms Phoenix allows for special edition to you create your own. We have the magazine, freedomsphoenixezine.com. Go to the e-zine. My cover, the cover graphics are awesome, done by an 18-year-old that never been in a public school, lives on a farm in Missouri, raised by an anarchist friend of mine, self-taught herself, graphic artist makes, makes a living doing that. We have the radio show, and we're starting a newspaper. Pen and ink, no, it's uh, pen and paper dot info. Because we used to do newspapers back in the day, and I could see what's happening. When I go and speak at festivals in rural America, a lot of people will come up, hey, I heard you, I heard you on the, the radio on satellite. I saw you on TV, which is Roku. I didn't even know Next News Network had a Roku. And this one girl, she's 24, she came up and she said, she goes, Mr. Hancock, I found out about you by listening to you on TV. And I'm going, she must be mistaken. There's not, you know, on TV. 
Well, she goes, well, it's really not TV. It's on the speakers that the guy that listens to you on TV next door that pipes it out to his workshop in the back so loud that I listen to it that way. <laughs> and I got hooked in. Well, I found out later somebody did an app for, you know, like a your Roku, and it is on TV. But what really impacted me was that rural America doesn't have broadband. They're doing you know, satellite at best and often dial up, and they don't have a lot of talk shows that they really like that give any kind of a freedom perspective. There's nothing on TV. You know, so where do they get their information? So we decided, we used to do newspapers, and I remember this in the 90s, it was shortwave radio. It was all the people were getting all these guys, you know, Renz and Alex Jones and all these guys, these patriots and everything, they started going. But now there's a whole new fresh crop of podcasters, young people that are getting even edgier. So I'm going, these people are underserved. They can't even listen to these shows or download or know they're there because they don't have the bandwidth to do the surfing like we do. So we're going to be starting a newspaper that's going to have the front cover. It's going to be awesome and great. Everything we do is awesome and great, in my opinion. And what happens is we're going to influence them to learn about certain issues. We're going to give them search terms of things that they can look for themselves and send them directly to the websites to begin their education on leave me aloneism. And where's the Libertarian Party in this? Arizona, it was always Arizona. We had a lot of stuff going on in Arizona. You know what I mean? It's uh, Washington, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, Arizona Libertarian State. Why? It wasn't because of the party. It wasn't because of the elected offices. It wasn't because we had legislators. It wasn't because, it was because of the culture. And when you have drug legalization going to a conservative state like Arizona, when you have unrestricted concealed carry, you know, without a permit in Arizona, why did that happen? We had a group called SAFE. Second Amendment is for everyone. Are you a safe gun owner? Are you an unsafe legislator? We had safe shootouts. Safe this, safe that. Safe grandpa, safe, 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 safe. We changed the culture. The voting and, and creating this legislation and freeing us, you know, by decree of the king, is a side effect. And I have to emphasize this so much with you guys. If you're not, if you think that you're going to be, well, we'll be, you know, a little more free than the Republicans. We're not as bad. We, we'll give you, you know, government vouchers for your kids to go to mandatory youth indoctrination camps. We'll take your money a little bit less. Even the advocates for self-government, I remember when that uh, quiz didn't include one that says, Taxes should be reduced 50%. I remember when it was there shouldn't be any income tax. Why? It's a pandering. There is no pandering. And they didn't see it coming. So when Dr. Paul, we knew, we've had him at some, we knew him from before, we knew he was, and they were saying, yeah, we're just going to let him into the base and we're going to tell everybody that he really ran as a libertarian back in 88. We're going to tell everybody that. And what did they not know that we knew? He was not going to run from it. He was going to wrap his arms and leg around it and go, oh, yeah, me, Libertarian, man, we'd free dumb. How much bump did the Libertarian Party get out of that while you're nominating Barr? <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, so from our perspective, but was it a setback? Did we look like this was a, you know, a failure of some type? No, because we were changing the culture, the paradigm in which everybody swims. This understanding that you own yourself. We had to, remember, I was going on about the Obama thing, and they're going on about vaccines, and you got to get inoculated, you got to get inoculated, you got to, and what did we do? We knew if they inoculated the police and firemen that there wasn't going to be anybody to protect us, and we said, no, they're just going to get on the bus. So we go, all right. So we did a uh, special edition on Freedoms Phoenix, emphasized the vaccine vaccination thing, did a lot of um, research on it and such, but then we made signs. Support first responders that say no to mandatory shots. And they had a skull and bones with syringes like this, dripping blood, you know, that kind of thing. Here comes the press. They want to talk to you. And, I, and, and, and this is the rhetoric that I hope you'll embrace this concept. Well, don't you think in this and herd and mentality and we got to have and everybody's going to die and, uh, you know, pandemic and all this kind of stuff? And I go, look. The role of government is to protect my individual rights, to protect my, my property, to protect what's mine. And there's a big argument whether, you know, the government gets to go past your white picket fence onto your, your uh, property. There's an argument about whether they get to kick in your door or not, you know, when they get to do that. There's, a, you know, there's arguments about how much the children belong to the state and what they're going to do in their best interest. There's an argument, all this kind of stuff. But I tell you what, can we, I just hope that everybody will agree that my property at least is inside my skin. Can this be mine? Can I claim this as mine? Can I? It's like Jordan says, you ask a question. 
That goes out on the television, and all of a sudden that issue went away, and firemen in the communities all over Maricopa County were just sending the vaccines back, and it went away. Culture, ideas, what the goal is, how are we going to get out of this mess? The first thing is to know you need to get out of this mess, not be in charge of it. You know, it's always the entire Lord of the Rings, you had... You had Lord of the Rings, you had hours and hours and hours of a movie and a whole new trilogy coming again, and it was all about one thing. Libertarians are the hobbits. We don't want to wear the ring of power. We want to chuck it in the fires of Mordor. <laughs> What's the one scene that he goes, Frodo goes to Gandalf, here, I want to give it to you, take it. He goes, don't tempt me further. I would desire to do good with this power. But through me, it would wield such evil, too terrible to imagine. Well, it can't stay in the Shire. No, it can't. What must we do? Chuck it in the fires of Mordor. Up here. The revolution between, is between the ears. It's not something, what are we going to do? You know, our guns, we're going to storm the ramparts of Washington, D.C., and then you got, you know, revolutionaries in charge of, you know, revolutionaries in charge of Washington with guns. Yay. I'm so much better now. And the Fed? Ignore the Fed. Use silver. Use Bitcoin. Patrick uh, Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com, was on my. He's going to be a speaker at the Freedom Summit. He was on my show a couple weeks ago, and uh, he asked to be at Freedom. How come I didn't get asked? We come back on air, and you say you want to go, man. You're on. He's taking Bitcoin. Largest retailer in the world taking Bitcoin now. Cars are being sold. But is it Bitcoin? No, it's the philosophy behind it. The idea that, oh my goodness, but we can't track everything. Good. No, but, but I mean, it could be, you know, child pornography or drugs or, you know, bombs and whatever. And kind of, and, they, and that, that was a murgatory. We wouldn't know who did it. Good. See, the thing is, is that the people didn't get all fearful. A culture had changed enough that they go, hell yeah. That's what they're fighting. So what does J.P. Morgan do? They submit patents for their own cryptocurrency. 175 of them are denied. But you know there's one in there they got for something. It's a cultural battle. Libertarian activity, libertarian party involvement, libertarian ballot status, libertarian... This is the mechanism by which, and the original intent, David Nolan lived in Arizona. I know David well. I talked to him a lot, had him interviewed, talked about the beginning of the party, why we have different things in there. You know, I do not advocate the initiation of force or fraud, why that was in there. I mean, on and on and on. Why? It was because the Libertarian Party needed a vehicle or was the vehicle for freedom-oriented voluntarist, leave me aloneism, to be able to present itself to the masses. They would make the change. Not a shiny badge, not a party. If you are in a position now that you're just starting to get, you know, oh, we might be able to get elected. Oh, we have. You know, we got Susan here. I've interviewed her, you know, a couple of times on the show, walking through what she's doing, uh, you know, and now she's going to be what, mayor? <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, you're welcome. You know, thank you. Because what started her? It was the voting thing. It's all on computer. It's all, you know, seriously, we're being represented, and what are they doing? Rosa Corey, Democrats Against Agenda 21. She's going to be speaking at the summit. You know, she was a, um, I think she worked for the California Department of Transportation in valuing eminent domain seizures for when they're going to build whatever the heck they're going to do. So what did she do? She started to see how this Agenda 21 thing started coming in, how they were using it from the United Nations and this general plan and all this concept that we knew was coming in the mid-90s. I'll tell you what, they, you know, socialism, the new... I mean, uh, uh, environmentalism, new socialist flagship. What happened to Mikhail Gorbachev after the Soviet Union went? Where'd he go? Does anybody know? He just disappeared? Presidio. They privatized it. They gave him an office there called the Green Cross. Oh, God, save the planet. Got sucked up into the United Nations, and here comes Agenda 21. And then they went local government by local government to institute the general plan. And when you start doing schools and they have social studies, well, of course they're social. Is it freedom studies? Is it American studies? Is it, you know, some leave me alone studies? No. 
The, and I figured this out. When I go and speak at the different schools, this is what would happen. Elementary school, and I go, you know, and it's your own life, and you get to do this, and what about that, and your property and stuff and stuff. Yeah, cool, yay, you know, where I was better, it was like a movie, it was better than doing work and wins recess. You go to high school, same thing. I remember one, I go, all right, who has a car? How many have a car? You got a car? Who paid for their own car? This guy, to go, well, you don't use it all the time. This guy doesn't have a car. He wants to use a car. Can't he use your car when you're not using your car? No. Well, we all took a vote. We, we, we all voted that we, the whole, the whole you know, classroom, we voted to use your car when you're not using it. And he goes, um, nah, I got a gun. Oh. Well, the whole school voted unanimously. And he goes, I'd have to reload. <laughs> now, who do I want to talk to? His dad. That's who I want to talk to. See my point? But where was it that you got, I mean, I could get him, the, the, the clock would go, it'd be two minutes, and you know, you know the clock goes tick. And there's two minutes, and I realized this. It happened by accident one time, and I could do it every single time, but only with junior high. Seventh and eighth graders, why do they separate them? Why are they different? Why do, is that when they, they start you know, sex education? You know, that's when they start social studies. That's when they start a bunch of different stuff. You know, why then? Nazi Germany did it. Russia did it. China does it. That's when they start pulling them out. Ooh, you look like a gymnast to me. <laughs> you know, so why do they do it then? Because the hormones start flowing. That's when they start questioning authority. That's when they're starting, they go, damn, Skippy. Authority sucks, man. His name's Dad. There's a D.A.R.E. program. Go turn him in. This is what's going on. So as I'm there and I'm going, you know, talk about, well, more freedom gives you this, and I don't have my Jetson car because I'm not free enough, and they're not, and all this uh, uh, licensing and, and registration, all this stuff is because I don't have the uh, freedom to do this and do that, and I could, and we'd be a lot better off than in Jetsonville, okay? That was what would happen if we didn't have all this oppressive regulation and such. So what do we need? More freedom. What? I didn't hear you. Freedom. What? By the time it got to the top, I get these kids chant, freedom, freedom, freedom. They're going to the hallway, freedom, freedom. Comes back the next class, you know, after lunch, what happens? A teacher comes in, she takes a tripod, she bam, she puts her camera on there, and she's like, well, I'm going to get them on tape saying, because all these kids are coming into her class after that, I was doing it all day. All these kids would keep coming into her class, freedom, freedom. Well, he's uh, talking about this and that, and well, of course that was countered everything that she wanted. She's going to get me. Towards the end of that presentation, she goes like this. She says, yeah, but what about, and whatever it was. And I go to the kids. I go, well, what is it? More freedom, freedom, freedom. <laughs> Seven, eight years of indoctrination wiped away in one freaking class. That's what we need to do. That's what our role is, is to change the paradigm, to change the way people think, to advocate proudly and understanding that it's a better life for everybody involved. Health care to go, oh, how are we going to get health care to the poor? Well, keep it from being so expensive. Stop licensing everything. Stop regulating. Stop. If I want to have a 16-year-old do brain surgery on me, well, I might need a 16-year-old do brain surgery on me, but, you know, it might be Doogie Hauser, and he's cheap. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, so my thing is, is that why don't I have the freedom to do what I want with mine? Why? Why? It's us, it's you, it's everybody in our society that is making the argument for we just need to be ruled better from a guy with the right paperwork. What if your mindset is totally different than that? What if you're not looking for Pharaoh number 300 and something? What if you're exposed, to, and we had the uh, philosophy of liberty, the, bl the black cartoon animation stick figure thing, the philosophy of liberty, it wasn't translated. Yeah, I called uh, Ken Schooland, you know, and so I said, hey, man, it's not translated into Arabic. He goes, yeah, it's kind of complicated. We have, but we got this guy in Moscow that kind of done. How much we got to pay? We raised $1,000, which is probably a billion dollars, some guy in Moscow, you know, $1,000 to have him in 10 days translate the philosophy of liberty into Arabic. We did thousands of DVDs. You're talking about we have DVD duplicators. We do three to 500 DVDs an hour. I got 25,000 blanks just for when somebody pisses me off. <laughs> so I go, so we did thousands of these, and I go, yeah, Sandy Hook got a dose too. That was another, anyway, I had 30. But anyway, so, so now we did thousands of these, and we shipped them to Alexandria, not Virginia, Alexandria, Egypt. And they went to Tahrir Square, and they passed these out, and ISIL goes, holy crap, what the hell are you doing? 
The second most popular country behind the United States of downloading these videos is Saudi Arabia, followed by Morocco and Egypt. How did that happen? Because these young kids, finally for the first time, got the philosophy of liberty and understood it's about self-ownership. It's not about a new ruler that's going to promise you whatever the heck they're going to do that week. The second that we as a party the Libertarian Party understand that we are a liberty nexus, that we are a source of material, of, you know, of pamphlets, logos, artwork, you know, to bring people together just to find in your zip code where to go and kind of do and whatever, and you are on your own to do whatever you want with the resources of and peace out. We're worried about the next person to inspire. When, as long as when we finally come to that conclusion that we're here to change the culture, not to get a shiny badge, the world will be different. That's where I'm going. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Is everybody awake now? That's the whole point of putting them on after lunch, guys.